Hi, FD, and welcome back to this, this second part of the question and answer session. After you've watched um, a clip by Patricia Burt Brogan, either, as we said, through the Dublin Arts and Human Rights Festival or um, in the classroom as part of your Leaving Cert curriculum. Now, with me on the panel still, we have Kate Canning, uh, the director of the production. But this time, we're also delighted to welcome to the theatre Dr Maeve O'Rourke. Um, Maeve is a lecturer in human rights at the Irish Centre of Human Rights in Galway. In 2010, she has, since 2010, she has provided pro bono assistance to the Voluntary Advocacy Group, Justice for Magdalens, and she is currently a member of their research team regarding this. Now, her advocacy concerning Ireland's Magdalen Laundry's abuse and the forced separation of unmarried families in Ireland during the 20th century has really received national and international recognition. So Maeve, thank you so much for joining us. So can we perhaps ask you to go really back to the beginning and perhaps explain to everybody where the Magdalen Laundries really started? Okay, well, Magdalen Laundries were in operation when the Irish state uh, came into existence. So from the date of Irish independence in 1922, there were already these institutions operating in Ireland and they had already operated as well elsewhere in Europe and in England and we're understanding more and more nowadays about Magdalen Laundries in America and Australia. Um, as they were closing down elsewhere, however, um, Ireland began to use them with a particular vengeance and in a particularly punitive way. Um, I think it was connected with the Irish establishment's desire to project an image of Ireland that was pure and Catholic, um, where there was no sexual abuse, where women only had their children inside marriage. Um, and as a result, the church operated with the state to hide away and incarcerate huge numbers of our population and that was children who had been abused, girls who'd been sexually abused, girls who grew up in the care of the church and then were considered, quote unquote, at risk of becoming pregnant outside marriage. And so they would be incarcerated as a preventive measure. Um, in fairness, uh, a lot of different reasons mm -hmm. um, meant the incarceration of girls and women because the way that the Magdalen Laundries operated was wholly unregulated, so without mm -hmm. a legal basis. And that kind of meant that people could end up in there for any reason or no reason at all. Mm -hmm. And the state funded Magdalen Laundries in a variety of ways. So the women and girls in Magdalen Laundries, while locked in, uh, were doing the state's laundry for almost every government department, state agency, or a son Uchtheron. So the state was um, paying the nuns. Mm. The girls and women were not receiving wages. The state knew this. It wasn't receiving any pension contributions from the nuns for the girls and women. Um, so it knew well that the girls and women were not being paid. The state was also using the Magdalene laundries as an alternative for prison uh, in certain cases and in certain institutions. So it knew that they were places that locked girls and women in. And yet um, it failed to ensure that the girls and women's rights were, mm, were respected. Uh, it, it seems to have visited them um, as factory premises, like state factory inspectors seem to have gone on and off to the 10 Magdalene laundries, but um, they only ever inspected the machinery to check that it was working properly. And they didn't speak to girls and women. They didn't check whether they were being forced into servitude or slavery. Um, and so unfortunately, once inside a Magdalene laundry, girls and women had no idea if they would ever manage to leave and really their rights were entirely restricted down to not even being called by their own name anymore. Mm -hmm. And what was it that got you interested in it in particular? Well, I went to UCD to study law in 2005. And when I was finished in 2009, I had developed a great interest in human rights law. Mm -hmm. And I was always interested in human rights in secondary school as well. Um, but we definitely learned about human rights, I think, in retrospect, very much as something that concerned people in countries other than our own. 
So we learned about children and people in poverty in other countries. Mm -hmm. We learned about the UN and different UN agencies and how they help people in developing countries. But in 2009, just as I was getting ready to go to America, I went to Harvard Law School for my master's. And that summer, um, the Ryan Report was released. And that was a 10-year investigation into the endemic, in other words, wholesale abuse of children sexually, physically and emotionally in state-funded, church-run, industrial and reformatory schools. And these were schools set up in institutions run by priests and nuns, state-funded, that operated um, to incarcerate needy children. And it does seem that it was in the interest of the church to receive more and more money for every child that it had in these institutions. So, you know, there was an interest in gathering in more children into these institutions. And although the state funded them, they failed entirely to protect the children in them. Mm. And this report came out in the summer of 2009 and there was me getting ready to go and ideally have a job at the UN. And I started seeing people who had been in these institutions who were now in their 60s and 70s and they were speaking on the television about what happened to them. And I just realised straight away, you know, I don't need to go anywhere to work on human rights. Now, I didn't need that to show me that, but I suppose I personally did this, you know, no one needs really to be shaken to mm. see outside their front door that we have human rights problems every day of the week. We have homelessness, we have domestic violence, we have child abuse, and people are not sufficiently protected in our society. But I suppose for me, I was really shaken by the testimony of the survivors of industrial schools. And so when I got to America, I actually started to research more about the church-run institutions that had operated during the 20th century. And because I was starting to do um, the law of sex equality and feminist approaches to human rights, I realized that investigation actually had left out the Magdalene laundries and it had left out, of course, other institutions that we're now starting to understand more about, including mother and baby homes, mm. county homes, and our whole adoption system, which was highly coercive and forced for the whole of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And Maeve, you're obviously a, just a, such a passionate advocate for the women. Um, and obviously you've developed, you know, relationships with these, with these women. Um, and can, you, can you tell us, like, I know it's very complex, but well, can you give us an idea of where you are with, with the fight for justice for these women now? Yes. So um, happily in 2013, we had our first big victory in relation to the Magdalene Laundries, and that was uh, the then Taoiseach Endekenny's state apology um, mm -hmm. on the 19th of February 2013. And that was a huge mm -hmm. yeah. moment. And a lot of campaigning had gone into that. Um, I had worked with colleagues in Justice for Magdalene's. A lot of women had been campaigning. I mean, individual women have been writing to government officials and politicians for decades. So they were absolutely the first people to be campaigning. But more of us joined them and um, Claire McGettrick and Mary Steed, who were involved in the setting up of Justice for Magdalene's, were absolutely key. They um, are both adopted and Mary's mum um, was in a Magdalene laundry as well. So that group, Justice for Magdalene's, that I've done all the work with really does stem from the personal perspective of people mm -hmm. who are affected. But we did a lot of campaigning to get to the state apology and that did involve taking a lot of witness statements. I went to the UN Committee Against Torture with the issues, made legal arguments. We did a lot of political campaigning um, and there was an inquiry, the... McAleese inquiry it was mm. called because Martin McAleese who was a senator at the time the husband of our former president he chaired an inquiry into the state's involvement with the Magdalene Laundries for two years between 2011 and 2013 he and a range of civil servants gathered all the state documents that showed how the state had actually been involved in and knew of what was going on in Magdalene Laundries he gathered all of the religious records but they only gave permission to use the records on condition that everything would go back to them and that he would destroy all his copies. So unfortunately now the archive only contains state files. Um, 
But that inquiry was key then to leading to the state apology. Now, actually, the day that the inquiry came out and the report of the McAleese inquiry came out, it was not clear at all that the Taoiseach would apologise because actually that inquiry did not investigate the question of abuse. It was like a halfway house. It was, it was a measure that the government agreed to when we were campaigning back in 2009, 2010, 2011, saying there was massive human rights violations here, the state is responsible. And they kept saying, these were private institutions, nothing to do with the state. Mm. So then their concession in 2011 was fine. We will inquire into the extent of state involvement, but they never actually inquired into whether human rights violations and constitutional rights violations like arbitrary detention, like forced labor, labor, slavery, servitude, torture, other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment, whether any of those abuses happen. So actually the report is quite weak in relation to the abuse. It gives testimony and it reflects on how sad it is mm. that the girls and women never knew if they would get to leave but it doesn't actually find that it was unlawful so it was problematic and luckily that was the 5th of February 2013 and luckily we in Justice for Magdalene's had done a parallel inquiry of our own and we had been working with lawyers who recommended do you know what this inquiry is not investigating abuse you really need to do do it so that you can hold the politicians to account when this inquiry is released. And we gathered 5,000 pages of evidence, uh, including 800 pages of witness testimony. And um, we made a legal argument that was 150 pages long as if we were going to the high court okay. to yeah. argue this. And we were able to give that to all of the politicians. And we did so much media advocacy yeah. and ultimately forced the... <laughs> government to say yes we recognize these were massively abusive and then the government set up a redress scheme um, which was designed by Mr Justice John Quirk who was the previous head of the Irish Law Reform Commission. He spent three months speaking to over 300 women who'd been in Magdalene Laundries about what it was that they needed mm -hmm. and he announced a scheme or sorry he recommended a scheme that the government announced to provide pensions so now if a woman can demonstrate that she was in a Magdalene laundry, um, she's entitled to the contributory state, state okay. pension um, for the rest of her life. She's also entitled to a lump sum of up to 100,000 euro if she spent 10 years or more in a Magdalene laundry. Now, that is actually a tiny sum mm -hmm. yeah. uh, compared to what people PMUs. might get in court yeah. for being uh, detained for imagined 10 years. Um, yeah. And actually, you only get half of it up front, and then the other 50,000 is given to you by the state according to how long they think you're going to live an actuarially calculated weekly payment. And if you die before they expected you to, then the rest of your money that you didn't get goes back to the state. Oh, my goodness. Um, and then there was a promise of health care. Uh, they promised a card that goes way beyond the ordinary medical cards that people get in Ireland if they have um, a means test. And it was supposed to give private access to, in particular, home care. It's really important because people who've been abused in institutions shouldn't have to go into a nursing home oh, um, no. when they're older. Tra that would be mm, serious. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it was supposed to give private everything else, uh, home care, occupational therapy, renovations to home, um, dental, everything. But actually, it's not that. It's pretty much the ordinary medical card with a couple of add-ons like private GP it's really not what was promised and that's been recognised by many, many people. And unfortunately, it still hasn't been given to the women. So that's one of the things that we continue to campaign on. Okay. And another thing that hasn't been given yet is a form of memorialisation. Um, the women said that they would like to meet each other uh, because many of them, if they escaped, it was without notice. Their names were changed in the institutions. It's been very difficult for the women to meet each other, each other. since. Yeah. And they wanted to consult and to oversee the creation of a national memorial, which could be a museum or other place mm -hmm. of memorialization so that future generations could learn about these abuses and so that it can never happen again. And we definitely see that survivors of these gross abuses really speak out because they want to make sure that things change. They know, you don't have to tell them, nothing's going to change the past for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What they want is for it to have mattered mm -hmm. so that it doesn't happen again. So that's what memorialization means, making sure it doesn't happen again. So because no movement had been taken on that in 2018, 
um, my colleagues in Justice for Magdalene and I and Nora Casey, um, who's a very successful businesswoman, mm. came together and voluntarily arranged um, an event called Dublin Honours Magdalene's. Um, we did manage to get the funding from the Department of Justice after we'd organised it, which was great. And over 200 women came from all over the world. Right. And they met each other and they spent um, one of the days discussing in tables of 10, each facilitated by a couple of academics or other people who have mm. been involved in research and advocacy, um, discussing what they would like us to know about what they went through, um, what they want done about it, and their views on what memorialization mm. means. So that report is really important reading for everybody. Mm. And it's available on the website of the Justice for Magdalene's Research webpage. It's under Dublin Honours Magdalene's, the findings of the listening exercise. And really what spurred us to act in 2018 in particular was that Dublin City Council was about to sell a two-acre site in Sean McDermott Street in Dublin, which was yeah. the last Magdalene Laundry to close in 1996. Genie. They had got this site in a land swap with the nuns and left it derelict for 20 years. And it's in the heart of our city centre, in a very historic area. And they wanted to sell it for 14 million euro to a Japanese budget hotel chain. Um, that was going to put like a spar in the front facade because it's not even a listed building. And... Gary Gannon, who was a councillor in mm -hmm. Dublin City Council at the time from that area, campaigned heavily with other councillors and ourselves. And that was also the summer that the Pope came to town. And it was everything at once. And the women had met in June and the Pope came in August and Dublin City Council was trying to sell the Sean McDermott Street Magdalene Laundry. <laughs> oh. And there was a huge gathering of activists under the banner of Stand for Truth, which people might have heard of um, because it's quite a good hashtag now on Twitter, for example, um, when we're talking about the need for access to information. Um, and so Colin McGorman of Amnesty International, who's a survivor of clerical abuse, um, gathered together a group of activists and we all got together at the same time that the Pope was saying Mass. And after some music by amazing artists, there was a silent march down to the Sean McDermott Street site. And ultimately, the Dublin City Councillors agreed not to allow it to be sold. And now there's consultation ongoing and a group of fabulous architects under the name CoLab and acting with a group of academics called Open Heart City Collective, which again, you can find online at the openheartcitydublin.ie website. And what's happening is a big consultation with these architects offering designs for a real regeneration of that site that would offer a museum, mm. a dedicated archive, social enterprise space for survivors in the community, third level education, because that's something that's wanted by people in the community and social housing. Um, and we do feel that there's a need for a dedicated archive and truth telling, not just about the Magdalene Laundries, but actually about all of the related mm -hmm. institutional right. abuses because yeah. the Ryan Commission, which I mentioned, the 10-year investigation into child abuse, um, that whole archive of 2 million documents has been held um, at the moment. The government tried last year to legislate to make it secret for 75 years, every single document in it, even from survivors themselves, that they wouldn't be allowed to have access to even their own information in it or any of the administrative records like inspections, all the government files, all the correspondence, everything from the bishops, the diocese, everything. Um, so that all they'd be left with is this report, which is one commission's perspective, but not the underlying evidence. So that's now mm. kind of in limbo. We have the Macaulay's archive, which is all of the Magdalene state files that were gathered. Now, the Macaulay's inquiry said it should be available for future research, but ever since 2013, the Department of the Taoiseach has been holding it secret. And every time we apply under freedom of information for anything in it, even the index, because we recognise it might be copies only of things that are still in other government departments, but you need the index to know what to go and try and recreate. They say, you can't have the index, you can't have anything, because we are holding it for safekeeping and not for the purpose of freedom of information. Um, and actually, a survivor managed to bring a case to the information commissioner mm. and get a decision in January of this year that that's unlawful. But we still haven't seen any movement. Nice. And now we have a commission of investigation on mother and baby homes about to okay. report this month. And the government says that it is going to seal its entire archive for the next 30 years. So what we're trying to say is 
we could do something different and we absolutely have to because these are massive human rights violations and people have a right to the truth. And there should be a dedicated archive and we have started to work with the Stasi Records Agency in Berlin, which is a fascinating and excellent example, compliant with European Union data protection law, um, of creating an archive that puts those who suffered abuse first and foremost at the centre where they can get every piece of information that relates to them. And actually, you can see what other people did to you. People in positions of authority do not get to be redacted from the files because it's your information. Mm -hmm. There is a concept of mixed personal data under EU law where but two people can own the same information at once. So you and I can get our medical records. They name the doctor because who the doctor was is relevant yeah. to us, what they did to us. And we need the same to apply in relation yeah. to so-called historical abuse. And we also need to see the administrative records. And Maeve, can I ask you, mm. like, does it all come down to money? <laughs> the desire to seal away all yeah. the information. I think part of it is that because okay. they realise perhaps that accessing information makes it more possible to go to court. Or who vulnerable? I it's know. impossible to go to court without the evidence, I know, really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And so, but why other? Like, what? What's, yeah. Is it fear, shame? I think there's is also it... fear and shame. Okay. And and there's also like, mm, there's also a, a total refusal to recognise that abuse happened. Really. There's a horrible um, vicious circle going on where the Gardaí have not property fully investigated, or at least the director of public prosecutions, if they have investigated, has not recommended prosecuting anything, really. None of the Magdalene Laundry's abuse, the mother and baby mm -hmm. homes, the forced adoption. There have been some prosecutions, but tiny, tiny, tiny numbers of child abuse by um, religious mm -hmm. orders, um, people in religious orders. But generally, there's been no, no prosecution, and that is because there's a refusal to recognise mm. that these were crimes. Mm. And, and that, like, I am a feminist lawyer. I can see mm. that what happened in the Magdalene Laundries was so wholly so criminal and, mm -hmm. and abusive under, and, and a violation of constitutional rights. But one of the things when you learn feminism of any sort, feminist approaches to law, is that often what happens to women and girls just isn't actually recognised and doesn't make its way into what people understand the law to be all about because women have not for so many centuries and decades and been in positions of power. So their experiences are just eclipsed. Mm. Um, so there hasn't been prosecutions and then people have found it very difficult to get to court because we have a statute of limitations that requires you to bring your case within yeah. a few years of suffering an injury yeah. and it's got very little room for relaxation. And also, um, if you sue the state or the church in Ireland, the general rule in Ireland is that if you sue and lose, you have to pay the other side's costs of defending your case. No matter how important your case is, no matter yeah, how important it is for it to go forward and how little money you have to, do, to take that risk. And from day one... A defendant, whether it's the church or the state or both, in the case of these abuses, you'd be suing them both, they will both write to you and say, if you don't drop this case, you will lose your house, essentially. Or like, we will come after you for the cost of all our lawyers who are about to have to do all of this work. And um, <laughs> Louise O'Keefe is a prime example of this. She suffered abuse in a national primary school in the 1970s right. at the hands of her principal, mm -hmm. who was state funded because the Irish state pays for national schools, uh -huh. but employed by the church because we have this arrangement where the state pays the salary, but it doesn't actually do the hiring because the church managed to make sure that it gets control over primary education that the state then funds. Mm -hmm. So she sued the state and the court said, actually, there's no vicarious liability. There's no actual liability on the part of the state for what the Church, church principal parish. does, because right. the principal answers to the parish priest as the board of management chair. And so she lost her case in the High Court. She lost her case in the Supreme Court. Um, she actually won it at the European Court of Human Rights in 2014, uh, establishing a highly important precedent that right. where a state has reason to know that there is a risk of children or anybody suffering torture or other cruel and inhuman or degrading treatment, which includes rape or sexual assault, it has to have mechanisms to protect. And in this instance, in primary schools in general, 
um, parents were always directed to the Board of Management and there yes. was no oversight by the state. The point is, though, when she lost in the High Court, the High Court made an order against her for half a million euro in costs. And she just was brave enough to keep going. Yeah. And to keep going, and at the end of the Supreme Court case, when she lost, they then said, oh, we need a hearing on costs that happened six months later. And then yeah. the Supreme Court said, actually, this was a highly important case yes. in the public interest. We will not make any order for costs, but imagine. So there's massive um, barriers to mm. getting to court. And because no one's got to court, the state officials like to say, uh, there's no legal fighting of abuse here. Mm. These people are upset and we're really sorry they're upset and we're going to do our best to address the hurt, but it's not actually legally wrong. Um, <laughs> and so we do have a very vicious circle because to come back to your question, why, why the secrecy? Like, yes, I think people are ashamed. Maybe there's a displaced loyalty. They don't want their superiors or their predecessors in the civil service or... I don't know, their mm. family members who might be named in these records being outed, so to mm. speak. But like linked to that is also a refusal to recognise that massive um, constitutional rights violations happened here and that people have basic rights now to accountability and redress. And part of the reason they won't recognise that is because the courts haven't forced them to. And part of the reason no one's been able to get to the court is yeah. because the state hasn't taken measures to enable people <laughs> to get to the court. So it's a vicious mm -hmm. circle. Vicious yeah. circle, yeah. completely. And that's what happens when the state is responsible for abuse. Right. Because you're trying to get it to hold itself to account, which is why we, the people, need, need to, to be so strong. Okay. The mm -hmm. only way you ever get the state to hold itself to account is through, you know, democracy and massive people power. Mm -hmm. And it, so that leads me on to this question. So, because we're talking to so many 17 and 18 year olds today, which is brilliant, you know. Mm. Um, so two, two parts of this question. First of all, what can we do? What can, the, what can our audience do? Mm. And secondly, are you hopeful? <laughs> yes, um, I am hopeful because I really do think I teach first years uh, in NUI Galway and they're really passionate Great. about making change. And um, even with the climate change now, I really feel there's a need and the students respond well to discussing from the beginning of their degree. Like if you care about human rights, these are the ways that you can act. And I think that younger people really feel that they mm, want yeah. to act, um, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Because like I say, it, we are lucky enough to live in a democracy mm -hmm. and we can and we should act. Um, but uh, hold on, what was the first? I just what can we, what can we do? Couple, yeah, yeah, so what can we do? Can we do? Um, Practically, because yeah, I always yeah. I'm like, well, I'll, what can yeah. I do? Yeah, and it, it was you know it's very interesting about what you said about the steps you you took with whether with, whether with Sean McDermott and and the, that whole kind of communal thing where the Pope was here and we were like that's incredible and obviously there was huge level of stand up and fight at that point yeah. and wh where can we go from yeah. here you know so the stand for truth like stand and then the number four truth, truth. if you even look for the hashtag for sure. example on Twitter like that is definitely a growing movement great and um, I think we all need to get together behind the need for truth telling it's not okay for one commission of investigation to have a monopoly on telling history like the MacLeese inquiry or like the Ryan commission or like the upcoming, your student, all the people watching, all the students watching now today are going to see in the news in the next while the report of the Commission of Investigation into Mother and Mother Baby Homes. Babies, yeah. And it's not enough. Like, that is not sufficient history. We need people to be able to access their own records. Like, there are still mm. unmarked graves all over Ireland because the information has not been produced to those mm. who are affected, family members, people themselves. So they need access to their information and adopt people need the right to know who they are. It is unacceptable for our state to turn a blind eye and to say, we just can't help you. This is all very sad and tragic and I'm mm. sorry that you're in this situation. No, like no. the state incarcerated unmarried mothers for a lot of the 20th century the only financial support it gave was to pay for institutions to incarcerate and separate people mm -hmm. from their children. Mm -hmm. And in 1967, 97% of children born outside marriage were adopted. Mm. And Lindsay Erner Byrne, excellent historian, has established that. And so, like, we are dealing with the situation of abuse and access to information is the number one step mm -hmm. to addressing yeah, okay. it. Nothing else will have any kind of integrity unless you first have information. So... 
people can really, you know, get on board with the movement for truth. Um, of course, the public and survivors of abuse and adopted people have the right to see the whole administrative archives. So, like I say, there's definitely a movement for a dedicated place of truth telling and archive, um, as well as just simple access to your rights right now for from wherever the information is, mm. we have very good European data protection law now, the GDPR, which people should be able to use. To um, so yeah. just general, I suppose, um, organizing. And then, um, you know, I've had, uh, I've, I've had contacts from students in secondary school who were doing their CSPE or their sixth year or leaving sort of just, politics projects yeah. in this. What I would say, is and the thing that hit me straight away when I started to interview and take witness statements from women who were in Magdalene Laundries when I was 23 and thinking what can I do and wanting to bring these witness statements to the UN like what hit me is this is not historical abuse it's not historical no so it's affecting it's people present. today mm -hmm. for as long as you have no access to information no recognition of the wrongfulness that is an ongoing human rights violation but also think about what does it say about our state if we are unable today to say you are a victim mm -hmm. of an abuse, you have a right to your information, mm -hmm. you have a right to access the courts, like it is a massive problem for anybody who suffers abuse today because it demonstrates the structures of our state. So are they even going to attempt to find justice for themselves? I mean, it's going to deter them, isn't it? It just shows that the state is still incapable of properly recognising forced labour, for example, yeah, or... Yeah its responsibility to protect from child abuse or um, family rights. Uh, so, you know, if we think about, for example, direct provision today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where is the accountability? Where is the access to information? Where is the transparency? Why are the contracts for all of the institutions not public knowledge? This is state-funded institutionalization. Mm -hmm. Where is the access to justice? Do people have easy access to lawyers? How do they make a complaint? Like. Can we, have we learned anything? I know that there are cam massive campaigns and the movement of asylum seekers in Ireland is amazingly powerful and there are many other organisations campaigning with them to end direct provision. And we definitely need to do that. Um, but it's also an important opportunity for us to stand back and say, right, like, where are the similarities? And there are many. Mm -hmm. The state has taken a total hands-off approach. We pay money, private organisations run them. Mm -hmm. Is that not fine? No, it's not fine. So by looking at the past, by seeing how abuse happens when the state pays for someone else to, you know, deal with what it has called a problem, and these are people, they're not mm -hmm. problems, but when the state outsources its obligations and its responsibilities and acts as if these people, you know, they need our charity, not yeah. people mm -hmm. have rights. Or... You know, we all have rights and we all have needs at certain points mm -hmm. in our lives. And the function of the state is to provide for us all as a community because we all contribute and mm -hmm. we all need at certain points in time. So just because you need help at a certain point in time does not mean you lose your rights or you're some kind of charity <laughs> case. Yeah. But that was definitely the way in the past and I really think it's still the way. Mm -hmm. So we as I'm still younger. We as younger people really do need to try and learn from our 20th century history so that we can create a, a far future. better yeah. mm -hmm. next 100 years. Mm -hmm. And Maeve, you're obviously here with us today in the theatre. So, um, and as, as uh, the director of Eclipsed, um, like we were so thrilled, um, the cast and the crew and myself, that you came to the play. Um, and many of your colleagues as well, which is wonderful. And um, I'm sure as such, you know, and uh, like you're so inspiring. My God, like I'm practically, mm, I know. <laughs> I'm practically quitting my job and joining your, joining it. But, but like, it must be wonderful for you to see a text like this featured on the Leaving Cert curriculum mm -hmm. and the fact that so many people will be exposed to the story. And I mean, for me, I'm biased, but I believe like being exposed to a narrative versus just maybe statistics is almost more powerful, like learning about these women's stories. And we met such gorgeous women in this play. Mm -hmm. And also it must be interesting for you that it's such a primary source because obviously Patricia Burke Brogan wor worked, uh, you know, in, in a Magdalene Laundry and spoke so eloquently and passionately about her disgust at the way these women were being treated. Um, so that must, that must be, that must be, yeah. 
you must get a bit of peace in your heart when you, when you know that. Yeah, to know that it's on the curriculum is absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah. and, and this play is an absolute treasure. Like, we are so lucky that Patricia Burke Brogan wrote this. Yeah. And, like, ha, ha, you know, we couldn't get much closer. Now, it's really important to listen to women themselves. And if of course, anyone yeah. wants to go onto the Justice for Magdalene's Research webpage, we have educational resources and many women speak out or speaking out. Um, and, and that definitely was something that the state apology in 2013 contributed more and more to. Um, but Patricia Burke Brogan, of course, is extremely close. And, and nothing is a substitute for listening for the, exactly. to the women. And certainly that was what made me realise these are human rights violations that mm -hmm. I could really you you know, heard. do yes. with working no. on. It was the people themselves. Mm. And I studied in Harvard Law School with one of the world's most famous um, feminist lawyers, Catherine McKinnon. And um, she just used to say, she used to answer every single complicated legal question that I would ask her by saying, ask the women, listen to the women. I had this really complicated question <laughs> when I was going to the UN Committee Against Torture about the fact that Ireland actually only ratified the UN Convention Against Torture in 2002 and the last Magdalene Laundry had closed by 1996. So how was I going to get the committee to exercise its jurisdiction over what happened before Ireland became a party? And she said, uh, speak to the women. Right. And really what the women were saying was this is not, this didn't finish in 1996 yeah. and that does translate actually into a legal doctrine of continuing violations that for as long as the state refuses to investigate, ensure truth telling, ensure accountability for what happened, yeah, for maybe what happened before it ratified a convention. For as long as it, you know, when someone comes to it with a complaint just says go away, we don't care. That's a violation of your rights as someone who suffered torture or ill treatment to those procedures of accountability, investigation and redress. So the women were telling me that. It was crystal clear, like I said, it was my first impression when I spoke to the women. This is not historical, it's ongoing. But um, I just think it is wonderful that we have this in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And actually... Um, I suppose Patricia Burke Brogan really immediately brings us into the fact that this was real because we know that she experienced it. Mm. Now, one thing that I was really struck by and still, you know, gets to me was that I had studied on trial. Mm. Mm. And we didn't have the conversation as far as I remember, but maybe we did, but maybe I don't remember it, about the fact that it was real. What was being told did, it wasn't, it was a fiction, like it was a fiction of a play. But I remember going to the theatre in Dunleary in sixth year and watching on trial. And at the end, and the lights go down, and her brother says, she was amazing, we were such good friends, but she brought shame in the family. And then someone else says, she was such a good worker, but I couldn't have her in my factory. Mm -hmm. And I still remember that. And when I was in Harford, I remember being like, oh my God, on trial was real. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that we have those discussions and that we reckon with the reality of what might be portrayed in fiction and so kind of make the connections. And what are your plans then for, you know, the next five years? What do you want to, you know, what have you got? I, we hate to ask really, you know, but what, yeah. what are your yeah. goals now to, to get the next bits over the line? Yeah. Well, like I said, we've been working with, we've met, we had the spokesperson from the Stasi Records Agency mm -hmm. in Galway, she came to Galway last December, uh, to tell us all about how their legislation works, that they have archivists who, you know, are sitting every day, all day, um, with the legislation in one hand, answering people's access requests, right. and okay. then how it works for if someone is a researcher or a television um, station and wants to look at the broader administrative files and what the permissions are and all that. Um, so I would absolutely love to see within five years, certainly sooner, but... I'd love us to have a dedicated centre of truth-telling and an archive where we put survivors and adopted people, people who've experienced, and, and second and third generation, in charge. You know, it could be an outpost of our National Archives. It could work with an outpost of the National Museum of Ireland. And it is overseen and you know, very much kind of driven by the people themselves who've experienced this and responds first and foremost to their need, of course, 
for information and then involves the, all of us in learning from it so that we can really invigorate and draw lessons and, you know, be hopeful about our next 100 years. I just feel so, so lucky to have worked on these issues and the gathering of the hundreds of women in Dublin in 2018, Dublin Honours Magdalene's, was absolutely amazing and we should be so, so grateful that people are willing to speak, are willing to work with us, to help us understand because we stand to gain so, so much mm -hmm. from just being willing to acknowledge, to listen and to try and do better in the future. Mm. Great. Oh, my goodness. Well, we cannot, I don't think we'll ever be able to thank you, yeah. seriously, enough for coming in today and talking with us. We, I mean, I feel absolutely honoured to have the opportunity oh. to hear your side of the story thank and everything you. with it. Just absolutely amazing. And I really think we need to urge everyone to please go on and look at Justice for Madeleines onto that website to get all the other background pieces with it. But Dr. Mavorok, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you.